So thanks for being here. So my name is Krasi. Uh, I work for SAP. And uh, yeah, so a few, few more words about myself. So the, the session was originally like named Extending Business Systems with Kubernetes, Istio, and Java. But actually, thinking about Kubernetes and Istio, and, and given that you know now much more about Istio than you knew before, uh, you can fill in any language here, actually. So it's, it's not in any way restricted or specific to Java. So you can use pretty much anything that you feel comfortable with. So a few words about myself. Um, yeah, that's kind of me a few years ago in, in Montreal. So actually, my, um, my extensibility journey, so to say, started very early. So back then, I was mostly into uh, playing computer games and writing about them. So already back then, the, the typical technologies I was mm, interested about was like Unreal Engine, Warcraft, Starcraft, these kind of things. Uh, I always wanted to have a multi-target railgun, never managed to build one because, you know, uh, Counter-Strike was not particularly extensible back at the time, or at least I had no clue how to do that. I mean, of course, all of that has prehistory. I've written my own snake games and so on, uh, but that's kind of past. Then at some point of time, I thought I should be doing something more meaningful with my life, so I started working for Prosist. So there I ended up into um, OSGI embedded servers, started learning Java. I had no clue about it before. Um, and everything was cool, and then one February, um, people there gathered us said, well, you know what, half of you have been acquired by SAP, and the, the other half remains here. And back then I was super curious, so is it now good to be acquired or not to be acquired? So it's always the choice that you have. And this is how Incumai Labs was, was formed. So I guess that was kind of a sandbox for SAP, so we stayed like that for two years, and then in 2002 that transformed into full-fledged SAP Labs Bulgaria. Uh, where the real fun started. So up to that point of time, I was kind of unsure whether SAP is kind of the company, it's a business software, mm, not sure. Uh, but then I actually ended up dealing with technologies. So what we built for two years turned to be the, the foundation of the SAP NetWeaver middleware platform. And this is where I got into like Java, Java E, uh, and a lot of those things uh, much deeper. So we started our own J sub JVM. So it's kind of a, back then a fork of the hotspot uh, JVM which at the time was actually the first one that implemented write once and run everywhere paradigm. Everybody else was kind of write once and run on our platform. Um, so we were the only ones that actually allowed you to write once and really run it everywhere. So we get involved in Eclipse. We evaluated Cloud Foundry back at the time in 2011 when it actually was released. Uh, we deemed it, you know, not community friendly enough. And then we moved on. So then 2012, um, I moved to Germany. So moved to the headquarter. Uh, and there I continued with the fun. So we had a cloud platform that we started in 2010. I was here in Sofia still. And then it evolved, went through a bunch of rebrandings and so on. Today is known as SAP Cloud Platform. And, but that's where I got, again, hooked back to my initial um, kind of passion about extensibility and was running the extension franchise there for SAP Cloud Platform. Until 2016, where I thought I make a switch and move towards not so much technology, but more like business applications, and I joined Hybris. Hybris was just freshly acquired by SAP. Um, and you know, I'm not sure whether it's luck or whether it's destiny, but I again ended up dealing with extensibility in Hybris. So, you know. Uh, and those are kind of the different things that, that I had to touch on the, on the way. So that's me. So now, having striked me out of the picture, uh, I represent currently the um, customer experience team in, in, in SAP, which Hybris kind of uh, merged into. And I'm going to get you to an extensibility journey. So as we discussed, you know, mine started with you know the railguns there in, in Counter Strike, and then over the over the years, I, I had many things that I wanted to build. I couldn't for one or another reason. But if you kind of draw a parallel back in time, uh, that's not a new problem. So back then, people were talking about uh, the new color, um, and you, know, you can choose any any color as long as it's black, um, and that was pure practical reason. It was just um, easier for production to do it that way. That was long ago. So if you move that to kind of modern times, it's the same challenge. Um, color is not a topic anymore, so nobody talks about it. Um, now you focus much more on leather seats and you know, other goodies in the cars. But you know, keep in mind, only black and white colors are free. All the rest you need to pay additionally for. So there must be a reason for that. Um, if you get into a slightly more modern factory, I mean, that's a picture out of the Tesla uh, production line. Um, there they move to the next level. So it's no longer about customizing your car and you know, building it to order. But there is a digital twin that's actually uh, following your car 
along the production line, at every step of the production line. So when the KUKA robots are coming in, if you have kind of an advanced navigation thing, they build like six holes. Uh, if you have like a basic navigation thing, they build two ho uh, four holes, and so on. And then that particular stop on the production line knows what it's actually working on, because there is a model of the same car following it along the line. Uh, and then you end up with hundreds of options that you can personalize that doesn't bring much of an effort to the production line as a result. So, however, with customizations there and selecting options, you can only go that far. So if you are not really of the kind that is settling up for like standard, uh, if you want to go beyond that, you know, that would be hard to kind of customize. So uh, if you want to get from sa standard equipment to kind of custom development, then you need to make a few extra steps. So and then the real question is, is that specific to cars in any way? And the answer is no, it's not. I mean, if you think about Adidas, Adidas has their speed factory construct where you go on the website, um, you customize your shoe, and that's your shoe. Before that, you went to some, uh, to some Adidas store. Um, you got a 3D model of your, of your feet. And then they're going to 3D print basically your individual shoe, which in the past has been a, a big deal for athletes um, and you know, people you know, professionally dealing with that. And now that's available to kind of mere mortals, I would, I would call them. Um, and it's not only Adidas, you know, Nike is going the same way, uh, so many other companies are going the same way. So it's all about personal and all about, you know, your stuff, not, not just some mass production thing. And if we move a little bit closer to software, so how does it look like from your perspective? So if you get a piece of software, whether it's software that you install or whether it's a service that you use, doesn't really matter, um, then you can configure it. But that goes as far as the code of the software actually allows you to. So the designers essentially uh, put in there certain configuration options, that's it. Um, so if you want to further customize that, uh, many pieces of software offer some sort of pluggability. I mean, you can add in there add-ons. They have limited hooks there to plug here and there. We're going to look at that a little bit later. But again, it's still as far as you know, the designers of the software you know, imagined that and, uh, and put it in there. So you're still running in the frame that was given to you. Um, if you want to move even further beyond that, then you go into extensibility. What's the, what's the major, major difference? What's, what's really the big step? The, biggest steps, the big step is that if you, if you get into extensibility, you're actually handing over the control to somebody else. I mean, you're handing over the user experience to some other piece of code. You have no clue what it's going to do with it. You hope it's going to be good. Uh, that's why if you go to any <coughs> app store, you're, you're listening there about uh, certification programs, security scannings. Mm <coughs> that's why some app stores have you know, better quality of apps compared to other app stores, which are putting less effort into you know, certifying applications and reviewing them and so on. But the, the essence at the end is that you have no clue what the code is going to do afterwards. And whether the, the code that you look at in the beginning is still doing as good as the code that comes with the next version, you still have no clue. So the result of that is that it's much easier for you as a provider and for you as a consumer to configure software, but you're, the, you know, the, the more demands you have, um, the harder it is to achieve it. Well, if you go to the, where is it? Like on the, on the it's like the left-hand side. Uh, if you go that direction, um, then you're more, more flexible, but there is more care and more things that you need to deal with. So having put the frame, um, some real-world scenarios. So since I'm coming from customer experience at SAP, um, it's, it's all about the customer experience, therefore. So we enable their customers to help their customers um, have the best possible experience. So without any particular ties to products and so on, what this is supposed to illustrate um, is the, the journey from an awareness of something. So you know, first of all, you need to figure out that you have a need. Uh, then, therefore, those are all the, all the uh, click bytes and so on across the internet, which are trying to capture exactly that kind of need, identify it and so on. Then going to advertisements, so you get, you see, once you browse for fridges, then you see fridges all over the internet. You know, it's not by chance, it's on purpose, uh, because people somehow identified your need of a fridge. Of course, most of them, they don't know that you bought one already, so you're going to still be seeing fridges all over the place. Uh, and then there is the magic buy button here in the middle, um, which ultimately every vendor is, is going after. And that's not the end of the journey, however. That's the point of time that some money change hands. And I mean, the remaining part of the journey still continues afterwards. So you might return what you bought. 
you might unsubscribe from the service that you subscribe to and so on. And again, that's just one possible way things go. Different companies implement different aspects of that. Uh, and for every customer, it, it's different pieces of the puzzle are actually involved. So that's why the, the bigger, the better, kind of. The challenge with that is that, as you can imagine, you know, few companies are providing all of that. And even if they do, few customers actually bought all of that from a single vendor. So the reality is that if you really want to be efficient across that whole landscape, which, as you can imagine, has multiple technologies, multiple providers, multiple SLAs, you need some common extension framework so that you can customize the user journey in a flexible and efficient manner. So how do you do that? On our side, we decided to go open and to introduce a project which is called Kima. Kima stands for WAVE in Greek. And we had to somehow, somehow follow the maritime team there for Kubernetes and Istio and so on. And the goal for that is to use it as a universal extensibility box. So how does that work? So if you have an application, ultimately what we need an application to do is to expose APIs, you know, as the first thing, and then provide events. And that's kind of the minimum that we need an app to be able to do. You know, some apps do not necessarily publish externally their events, so you might want to do some extra steps to push them to do that. We're going to look at that as well. But you need to get the events out of there so that you can consume them somewhere. So the previous session was talking about these kind of events which are immutable artifacts in time, so something happened in past time. This is precisely what we rely on here. And you know, majority of business systems actually have all of that in place. So the first thing that we need an app to do is to come over and say, hi, I'm an app, I provide the following set of events, and I have the following APIs that you can call. And then on the Kima side, we say, yes, acknowledge, thank you very much. Then we take all the services that the app provides, register them in a, in a catalog, so that they are usable afterwards. Then we also put the events in, a, in an event catalog. Nothing happened from, from here on. So the next thing that happens is that people interact with the application, therefore events are generated. So what are those events? So stuff like orders created, um, something got added to a shopping cart, you know, something is out of stock now, some order got canceled, some payment failed, this kind of stuff. Um, and then what you do, because of those things that happened, and those are kind of, um, immutable facts, uh, then it's up to you now to, to implement. So on the Kima side, we have an event bus, and we're going to look deeper into technology afterwards, which is invoking something. So what it is invoking? You can go to running a Lambda function, or you can go towards running a microservice. So since we, we sit on top of Kubernetes underneath, at the end, all of them end up being a pot in Kubernetes. So it doesn't really make much difference as much as the infrastructure is concerned. So the Lambda function on its own, then typically it's going to go back to the, to the system and then try to get some more details, try to trigger something there. So if an order got canceled, then you might want to extract the details, figure out why, and so on. It can also go and expose an API, making that kind of Lambda function also triggerable explicitly. So one thing is the, the event flow. So something happens, therefore you do something about it. Another thing is you expose your functionality as a microservice, which somebody from outside can explicitly call. doesn't need to be an event. Um, that makes it easier than to build reusable components in the picture. Another thing that your Lambda function could do is actually try to use some functionality from a bigger catalog of services. So if you think of a typical scenario where um, you have customers registering to a web store and uh, you want to give them 10% discount for the first purchase that they make. So what do you need for that? So you need a customer registered event. You take this one, you listen on it. Whenever you get it, um, then you go back to the system, you figure out you get the customer details. Then you prepare some sort of a template. So, dear customer, welcome. We are super massively excited there to have you to have on board. And then you call some other service to get a voucher code. You put it in the template, and then you use an external service to send an email, and then hit the, the user with that. Then the user, hopefully, is going to redeem afterwards the, the voucher code, which, by the way, is, is another factor which, um, which you can measure to see whether people actually read your promotion emails and so on. So that's more or less how things come together. So of course, we run that on pretty much any hyperscaler you can think out there. In reality, it, it only depends on Kubernetes. So you can run it yourself uh, on a laptop, on a cloud provider, or yeah, on a managed service. So the, the whole thing is relatively flexible. So putting the whole thing together, that's how things look like. So you have the application connectivity. That's where you expect all the apps to come over and register. You can expose services to outside world, or you can unify service consumption um, on the service catalog. To do that, we use the open service broker 
um, spec in order to consume service catalogs from multiple providers. So if you look at Amazon, Azure, and Google, all of them have already published open source service brokers that are exposing their services in a unified form. And we can consume them, put them in the Kubernetes service catalog, and then use them out of there. So let's get real for a sec. So we're going to go through a simple scenario. So how many of you have used up to now WordPress? No, and you're lying, actually, because the majority of the internet that you're reading, all the blogs that you're reading, most of them are sitting actually on WordPress. You just don't know about it. So what are we going to do? So we're going to be taking WordPress, and um, we're going to be extending it with Kima. So what do we want to do? So we want to have a blog post that gets published in, in WordPress. Um, we have several options to that. So we can either go crazy and build plugins for WordPress, which essentially means that we are risking to take the whole WordPress system down because we put in there some crappy code. This is the major issue with all the in-app extensibility, as we call it. The typical way this has been done for years is that you take a piece of code, you stick it in the same stack, and then your custom code is sitting together in the same basket with the rest of the software that you're running on. The result is that if you have like memory leaks, and you know majority of the systems that you find out there do have memory leaks, um, then they're going to take down the whole system altogether, your code including you know, the hosting code that, that you're running with. So this is what we try to decouple. So if you put Kima next to a system, then essentially the only thing that um, keeps them together are the events that are flowing in one direction, and then the API calls which can be flowing in both directions. But even if your code massively misbehaves, you know, tries to consume massive amounts of memory or massive amounts of CPU, your hosting system is still there and is still stable and is not really affected. You know, that's the one benefit that you get. The other benefit that you get is that um, you can upgrade the host system. I mean, you can go there, you can put next version of WordPress without major impact um, on the overall setup and without having to deal with custom code which potentially might not be compatible with the next version that you're trying to put in. So this is a massive problem for um, most of the enterprise systems out there. They're sitting on outdated pieces of software there because the, the sheer process of upgrading them and you know, verifying that they still work after the upgrade is a massive cost which, which many companies are not really willing to to take on. So what we're going to be doing, therefore, following best practices, would be putting a Kima next to WordPress. Uh, and then we're going to do two things. So we're going to listen to comments. So in a typical blog post, when you try to post a comment, you either need to be a registered, verified, whatever user, so that uh, the hosting platform doesn't have the kind of the fear that you're going to spam the hell out of it. Option one. Option two, um, if they keep it open, then they have a review process. So you try to post something, then it doesn't really show up immediately. Somebody has to go and um, effectively approve it. So some, something like a moderator. Um, so since we don't really want to be doing that manually, so we're going to be using Azure Cognitive Services here to kind of do the sentiment analysis for, uh, for the, the comments that we get. And we, only, we are only going to look at the English comments. So uh, for the other languages, we don't really have any experience how the cognitive services behave. Therefore, we try to keep it safe and stick to, stick to English. And then the other thing we're going to do is we'll post the same comments to Slack so that somebody looking at what's going on there with their blog can also follow how much adequate comments they get and how many got actually filtered out by the system and eventually go and tune it. So that's kind of our simple scenario for a demo. Want to dive into that? I guess yes. OK. Super. So how do, we, how do we go about it? So we have a WordPress instance that we're running here. We refresh that a bit, make sure that it's still live. So what do we have in there? So since I'm, I'm coming from commerce, you know, the, the, logical, the logical dream for commerce, e-commerce stores, is that you, you sell like large things, uh, which cost a lot of stuff. That's you know, the, the dream setup for a, for a commerce shop. Uh, then we, we, we decided on TVs here. So we have a bunch of TVs. Each of them has pros and cons. Um, and then we can comment on them. So we are go, we're going to go to, actually, is that visible to the back? Yes, it should be. So if we want to go to one of those, we can read about it. We can look at the pros and cons of it. Then we can leave a comment. So we can write something like, nice TV. A bit expensive, though. So then I still have to provide some details. Huh. OK, 
Okay, so probably it helps if I'm not an administrator, right? That's kind of better. I wondered, you know, who took down the moderator stuff? Yeah, that looks better. So coming back to my nice TV, and my name is Crossy, and my name is Crossy at example.com. Nope. Okay, super. So we post that. So the result of that is that, you know, first thing you see is that, well, somebody has to actually take a look at that because you never know. You know, might be, might be malicious, might not be. And then if you, if you try to refresh that, then you see that actually it went through. So actually it got posted. So if I try to do something else, like have something like Sean Fernseer wenn auch nicht billig which is more or less the same. And then we put another name, of course. Then I'm gonna see that this one is also going to stay for a while, but it's then gonna hang for a while. And you would wonder why that? Yeah, well, let's see. So the first place you can go to is you can go to our Slack channel, where things get posted. So if you go to the, to kind of the general channel, so that's where we have Akima bot, which is kind of posting that for us there, uh, and he's a member of all those channels. What do we see here? We see the first command that I posted. It's recognized as English. It's recognized as, as kind of uh, not really okay. Uh, I guess it, it gets the sentiment here about the price, but still gets posted because I'm an admin. So the second command basically is nice TV. It's recognized as English. It's recognized as positive, um, and therefore it gets posted. And then the third command that I that I have, it's recognized as negative for whatever reason, uh, but also recognized as not English. Therefore, it doesn't get posted. So that's how we can troubleshoot this kind of exercise. So if you if you have this kind of a flow of, of things going on, then you can see why decisions are taken and so on. So how did that work? So we have the Kima system that's running next to. Uh, to our WordPress. And in Kima, we, we have something which we call namespaces. So the idea of the namespaces is to actually segment their people and enable them to work without stepping on each other's toes. So what happens in a namespace is that we have in there services, um, and we have as well applications which are bound to it. So the only application that we have here is basically WordPress, and to use a bunch of services for which we have instances. So I spoke before about um, a service catalog. So the way that this looks here, um, goes in that direction. So you have a service catalog where we have add-ons and services. For the services, we have by default like the Azure, Amazon, and Google brokers packaged with Kima. And of course, you need to initialize them. So in order to use services from Azure, you need to somehow grant credentials to Kima to, on your behalf, create service instances because at the end, you're going to be paying for them. So you might want to be careful doing that. So in, in our particular case here, we have the exploded service catalog from Azure. So we have like uh, service bus, Redis, and so on. The particular thing that uh, we are interested in is the Azure text analytics. And when you, when you dive into that, um, then you can look into you know, what is the service about, and you know, what are the details of it. And all of that information is actually coming from Azure. So we have no clue what services Microsoft is exposing and um, how they actually um, organize that. So cognitive, uh, cognitive analysis there is an experimental service, so you need to explicitly uh, tick that on when you create an instance, because otherwise uh, it won't be available for, for your service instances. Then you can read more details about the different plans and you know how that, how that works uh, at the end. Um, okay, so then we have service instances in here that we managed. So if you want to add a service to your, um, to your environment, it goes more or less the same way for every service instance, regardless whether it's coming from Azure, from Google, from some other open service broker compliant vendor. So you go to add an instance, um, and then you can specify what exactly you want out in here. So if I take like the, the service bus queue, 
I will go that way. I'm going to specify a name. I'm going to specify a plan, and so on. Then at the end, I'm going to create a service instance. So since I don't want to be doing that, let's not go there. So what do we have now? So we have Azure, so we know how we did the text analytics. Uh, and then we have the WordPress, which is connected over here, sending events. So what event is actually uh, WordPress sending to us? I mean, that's logical next question to look into. Uh, ha, 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 lambdas. So if you look into the, the current set of functions which are deployed on that particular Kima instance, we have a local review. So it's actually not using the Azure text analytics. It, it gave us a chance to test. There is an NPM uh, module which is doing text analysis as well, so you can calculate sentiment with it. Um, and it kind of gives you this easy way to test without actually incurring any costs or without transferring any, any data out there. What is really actually triggered is the, the actual review. So is it that readable to the back, or should I try to zoom it even further? Oh, Not that much further. So what do we have in here? So since in Kima, um, we use Cloud Events as format for events, so pretty much any, any event source we, we expect it to be a cloud event compliant event source. With every event, we get an event and a context. So the, the event contains kind of the type, and then the context contains whatever you know, the sending system decided to put in there. So what we expect to get from here is basically the, it, again, remember, this is, this is just a, a comment posted event. So that was probably something I forgot to say in the beginning. So functions can be triggered several ways. So as I said, event trigger. And then we see here the user created event, which WordPress is sending to us. And then the other one we selected already, which is the comment post event. So we know that the comment was posted, but we have no clue what's in the comment. We have no clue who posted it. Essentially, we need to go back and ask. So this is where um, going back to the system part comes into the picture. So then we try to extract trace headers and so on. This gives us a chance to actually trace what's going on in case we have issues. And then we await to get the comment. So that's kind of an asynchronous call which goes back to WordPress, fetches the comment, then we get it in a JSON. So then the next thing we want to check is, is that actually English? And then assuming that we get English as a response, then we continue forward. So now you, now you know why my last comment was counted as negative, because basically by default we say we, we hold this, and by default we say it's negative. And in that particular case, I mean, we, we check that it's English, Mine obviously was not the last one, and therefore we directly moved through. So we never went through sentiment analysis. So assuming that it's actually English, uh, then we say, well, that sounds good, so let's, let's give it a go. But then we want to check whether it's actually um, positive or not. Um, if it's positive, uh, then we want to approve it, and then once we set it to status approved, then WordPress is going to automatically post it down, um, or eventually not. So it's going to remain there hanging for review. So that's more or less how the whole story goes. And then if you, if you look up there, um, the implementation below is pretty straightforward. Um, so we, we call basically Azure to detect the language with a bunch of parameters, and then we get a score. So certain level of certainty that you know, this is English or not. You know, there are cases where it's not really clear. Uh, but we, we took here like 0 0.9 as a, as a criteria. So if there is like 0 0.9 kind of confidence that that's in English, then probably it's in English. So that's how things went. And you know, this, is what, uh, this is what we used to, to do the, the analysis. The last thing that we do here at the very end, we actually post the whole thing to Slack. So Slack is yet another service that we consume from outside. It doesn't have, obviously, an open service broker provider, but you can also register it as a service manually. So it has an open API spec that we registered in here. Uh, and then we can call it, call it like any other service instance that we got from the OSB broker. Um, so then what we do there is we post the message to Slack with more or less exactly the structure. So what's the title, the pretext, uh, and then the markdown, and so on. So that's, that's all we do. I mean, that's it. So if you look at it, it's like 90 lines of code all together with the tracing, which is doing all of that. And I haven't touched WordPress so far, which is actually not really true. Because uh, WordPress, as you can imagine, out of the box doesn't necessarily register to Kima. So we, need, we had to do something about it there. So in going back into my WordPress, so what, we, what did we do there? So we wrote a Kima connector. As I said in the beginning, I mean, if you have an app which you know, natively doesn't really expose API um, events to the outside world, you, you might have to do it a little bit of a push. So that's exactly what we've done with WordPress. So we deployed um, a WordPress add-on here, which we call Kima connector. You can find it in GitHub, Links, link is later in the slides. And the Kima connector there uses the WordPress action hooks 
um, in order to generate events on our side. And then we configured in here what is really the payload that we expect from the events. Um, and then we keep them here. So whenever there is a, is a registration or whenever there is a comment post, WordPress locally is going to trigger basically the action hook, which calls our connector, which is making an HTTP call out to Kima to actually emit the event to the outside world. So that's kind of the minimal push that we had to do to WordPress so that it can plug into the picture. So in many cases, as you're developing um, your stuff or as, as you're administering you know, other pieces of software that you haven't really written, that would, be, that would be something that you might have to do in order to make it spill out events to the, to the open. So that's kind of the story. Um, if you look into you know, another Kima instance where we're not running WordPress and so on, you're going to find the catalog which contains everything that we have here. So we basically have an Azure broker. We have in here the, the one from Google initialized. Therefore, it's spilled out all the Google services in here. Um, and we have as well hybrid systems, which is mostly like the APIs which uh, our hybrid commerce is registering. So it's your systems that are connected there. So ideally, Kima is supposed to serve as the, the center point in your landscape, you know, getting events from everywhere and then giving you a chance to react on one or multiple events at a time. That's at least how we see it evolving. So, sounds good. I, I'm not sure I made, I made it in a minute, but that's fine. So, that's what, we, that's what we wanted to walk through. So, what are some technology choices that we've done? So, if you look at Kima under the hood, it actually contains a lot of stuff, and we're not going to go through all of that. But um, the, the, basic, the basic thing you have to remember is that it's actually 90% open source that we haven't written, 5% um, plumbing, uh, which we actually did write, and then 5% our own open source development. So compared to the, all the rest of the stuff that we are based on, I have my doubts we actually at 5%, but you know, that's where we're getting to. So our goal going forward is to be a super thin layer on top, which is making use of all the great innovation that you know, other people are doing out there, like Kubernetes, like Istio, like Knative, and so on, and you know, make sure that this becomes usable for enterprise scenarios, because being part of SAP, we're up to here in enterprise scenarios uh, day and night, so we have to deal with them. So some technology choices we've made. So if you look at Kubernetes, um, for us that's kind of the universal portability foundation. So you make sure that your stuff runs on Kubernetes means that it automatically can actually run on all the hyperscalers out there and a whole lot other number of providers that also offer Kubernetes in an, some shape and form. In the worst case, if you have the, the cheapest and derptiest possible um, VM hosting, you can also install Kubernetes yourself, and off you go there, you're portable there as well. So that's kind of your ticket to be able to switch and abstract away the infrastructure. So if you look at the Kubernetes ecosystem, those are just the vendors that do something about Kubernetes provisioning. It, it's estimated to, to total to 383 years of effort. Yeah, that's a super simple thing. You know, you take the amount of code in there, you divide it by how much you estimate a typical developer will do per day. You know, not the rock stars, but you know, the typical developer. Uh, and then you end up to 383 years of effort. And as of today, there are 5,000 plus people that actually contributed something to the core Kubernetes project. If you take the whole ecosystem, the numbers from last, year, last week, KubeCon in Barcelona was 31,000 contributors. So if you look at SAP, we also have a play um, in the Kubernetes provisioning space, um, because on our side, we also were looking into how to be portable across the board. Um, so early on, um, a team at SAP started looking into that space. So it also resulted into an open source project. It's called Gardener. Uh, and you can also find it in, in, in GitHub, similarly to Kima. So for, should I explain, you know, how Kubernetes works, or probably not? We'll zip through that. So, but, but, yeah, well, two things to say. So one thing is there is the Kubernetes control plane, or basically something that you need to run, which makes sure that the rest of it actually runs fine. So in a very simple terms, this is how, how things go. Um, in Kubernetes, there are nodes. You should think of them as VMs, but they don't necessarily need to be VMs. And then all of your workloads are actually scheduled there. So whatever you deploy to Kubernetes, you throw it at it, it will figure out where exactly to put it there uh, in the set of nodes that are available in the current cluster. So what does it handle, uh, what does it handle for us? It handles scheduling from one perspective. One thing is it, it actually figures out where there is capacity to run something. So if you think of those small functions and so on, all of them get out to wrapped in containers, get scheduled to the underlying infrastructure, and we don't necessarily care where exactly they will end up. I mean, that's up to Kubernetes to figure out. 
The other thing is if we have a function that kind of misbehaves, then Kubernetes is going to make sure that it doesn't go off limits. So in terms of memory, it's going to kill it if it does. It's going to restart it somewhere else uh, without us doing anything. So that's kind of the declarative state that you have in there. So you tell the system what you want it to be as a target state, and it will figure out a way to get there and constantly try to keep the state as close to your you know, declared uh, intent. Another thing is scaling. So you can configure uh, autoscalers for, uh, for your workloads on Kubernetes, um, and then it will like, start additional instances based on some criteria. So you can configure that. Can be CPU, can be number of requests, uh, can be other means as well. You know, naming and discovery is also something which is you know, out of our hands. So um, how services find each other there in the Kubernetes landscape um, that's handled by the infrastructure. And then load balancing across the different nodes is, again, something we don't really deal with. Storage, we use for like the pumping out logs, storing temporary data. Um, logging and monitoring is something that you have the means in Kubernetes to plug your own logging, and that's what we're doing. And then as well, debugging and introspection is, is pretty useful. So many people actually don't know that you can SSH in a container. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not advocating to do so, but you can if you have to, for whatever reason. And of course, it's a relatively bad idea to mess up with the container there, because the moment it gets restarted, everything you've done is going to be gone. So to be clear. But if you want to troubleshoot something, you technically can do that, assuming that in your landscape you have users, permissions, whatever. Um, you need to be careful with that. And then last but not least, Kubernetes defines like the airbag layer, so the role-based access control, where you can manage access to who can do what there with containers. So is anybody using Kubernetes at SAP? So we actually have a bunch of, of products. And you know, last but not least, we published last week a blog uh, about Kimo on Kubernetes.io. And then another blog that's sitting there since um, May last year is actually the one for Gardner. So like two minutes for, for Gardner. So what it is, what it is about? And you know, what's the benefit of it? So in Gardner, there is a notion which is called a shoot cluster. So what is a shoot? Why a shoot cluster? Because technically, you don't care about it. I mean, if you, if you go into all the cloud talks uh, about infrastructure, then you're going to hear a lot about treating VMs as cattle. So essentially, don't care about them so much. Don't treat them as pets. Keep them, keep, uh, treat them as cattle. So you assign them a number. And then if they get shot, well, you know, it happens. Um, so that's, that's, kind of the, that's kind of the thinking of, of shoot clusters there. And like every other full-fledged Kubernetes cluster, then, then you have like the control plane, which needs to be there, hosts the API server, hosts TTCD, which keeps all the configuration for Kubernetes and so on, and keeps as well a bunch of other valuable stuff that you might be running on that particular cluster. So what we do with Gardner is that we put another cluster, which we call the seed cluster, and we run one of those per region there in a cloud provider, and we take out the control plane and treat it as absolutely normal workload um, in that particular cluster. So what's the benefit of that? The benefit is that then your shoot cluster only contains the workloads that you are dealing with. And you know how and where the control plane is managed is actually none of your business. So ideally, it will be managed somewhere good enough you know, by, by, by folks who have a clue how to run that. So that's one less thing that you have to care about. Um, the, the other thing is that this also provides the perfect environment for, for people who want to actually provide Kubernetes as a service. Because do you really want to be having some, some uh, control plane that, you know, messing up with your workload? Probably not. And if you're dealing there with, with VMs and you're managing them manually or automatically, you never know what you're shooting down. So you don't want to be shooting down the control plane, trust me. So then we take the same manner control planes from other shoot clusters. And uh, here we heavily rely on the fact that Kubernetes by kind of initial mission statement is supposed to be the best orchestrator for any type of workload. And you know, control planes of Kubernetes classify as any type of workload, therefore should fit into that frame. And uh, in, in the KubeCon keynotes last week, it was referred to Kubernetes by inception. So now this is more and more becoming the norm of how you provide managed Kubernetes to people. Um, and you're going to be seeing that more and more. So then we run another cluster on our site, which is then um, used to configure and manage all the others. And then this is available on pretty much any infrastructure as well. So since it only relies on VMs, you can deploy it pretty much anywhere. So why is the infrastructure important? Because you want to make sure that you have plugins there to talk to the infrastructure so you can auto-scale up and down the respective Kubernetes clusters. So you don't want your cluster to be kind of a static set of allocated resources that you're always paying for. You actually want 
both the machines and the nodes, and they need to be elastic. So when you need them, you need to be able to get more, which is the whole benefit of using cloud. And when you don't need them, you need to give them up and you know, stop paying for them. So you have zero interest of running uh, idle capacity there, which you're paying for. So then moving on, the next layer on top of the chain is basically Istio. And you know, why do I say application server? Because you know, I myself spent like nine years in kind of application server development. In the beginning, I didn't really realize it. Uh, but then at some point of time, it became too apparent. Um, and then what is, what is the challenge there? Actually, application servers in the past were, very, were a very convenient environment for application developers. I mean, everything was taken care of for you, right? I mean, you had logging, you had tracing, you had administration, configuration, security. Uh, you had a nice web container that you deploy into. So you had the whole Java E set of containers that were dealing with your artifacts. It was a very cozy environment. So you write your stuff, you package it in a war, you deploy it, it's all good. And somebody else has to take care of to scale that around. Somebody else has to take care to update it, monitor it, upgrade it. You know, none of your business, right? Which is the ultimate promise there for you know, microservice development. Yeah, well, not exactly. Because the fact that you decided that application servers are too big and you don't want to kind of scale them as a monolith, but you want to kind of break them down in microservices, you know, the result of that was that the infrastructure is still there. It doesn't go anywhere. But uh, suddenly, your app had to do with a lot more things that it didn't have to do before. So you have to do now logging, tracing. You need to package a bunch of libraries there to do circuit breaking. I mean, you heard on the, on the lecture uh, of the React project uh, before, and the Reactor project, that you, know, you shouldn't have blocking code, ideally. Yeah, well, guess what? The majority of the libs that you're using um, are actually blocking. And in order not to block your requests, you need to have background threads, which are actually doing the polling and eventually passing you something. So in, in simple terms, this is called circuit breaking. And those are libraries that you package at the end in your app. So suddenly, your app is still the same app that you wrote before, but it has a huge bag of stuff that it needs to carry around and make sure that it's up to date. And you know, that bag of stuff, you actually have no clue what kind of vulnerabilities you have in there, what part of that is out of date, and so on. So this is where service meshes come into the picture. So if you think about all those interactions, majority of them can be actually solved on network level. So you don't necessarily have to carry that over yourself. You can still rely on this kind of service mesh layer, make sure that somebody's running that for you, somebody's upgrading it for you, uh, patching it for you, keeping it up and running, secure, and so on. So you can focus on your app. So all the things like tracing, logging, configuration, authorization, you know, mutual TLS bef between apps, this is taken care of by service meshes these days. And you know, there is no one service mesh. There are many of them today. I mean, you have Aspen Mesh, you have Linkerd, you have many options there uh, to choose from. And you know, the other benefit that you get that way is that you can actually write in any language. So it's suddenly not Java anymore. So if you if you're sitting in the application server before, that was mostly Java-based, or at least at most like JVM-based. So you could still run JRuby there and, and Jython and so on, but it was not a fun experience, neither for running, deploying, nor for troubleshooting afterwards. So now suddenly, you know, it's all equal. It doesn't matter actually what you're writing. So all that matters is kind of startup time, memory consumption, these kind of things. Um, so that's kind of a picture of, of, of Istio. It goes the same way. So there is a control plane with a bunch of central components, which are making sure that the rest of the mesh is actually running fine. You know, the essence, which uh, of course you've learned in the morning as well, is that next to every um, every pod there is a proxy, which in the, the Istio case is actually Envoy, and uh, the actual communication goes through the proxies. So your services actually do not, do, they never have to talk to something outside. They always talk to the proxy on localhost. And then the proxy figures out tracing, uh, authentication, routing, policy enforcements. And the proxies as well do other nice things uh, if you look into what we're doing there. So it does the discovery and routing, so that's one benefit. It also generates certificates. So every service in the, in the mesh is actually uniquely uh, identifiable. So at any point of time, without the service doing anything in code, uh, it can call another service in the mesh, and you would reliably know who is actually calling. I mean, you still need to figure out on top whether you need to propagate users or not, but at least the basic transport level authentication, you have nothing to do with. Then policy enforcement is another thing. You know, you can define who is able to talk to whom. You know, that's kind of uh, something you want to be uh, you want to be actively configuring. You don't want to leave it wide open. Rate limiting is another thing. So this, this kind of a belief that um, there is infinite scalability and it's, it's always amazing. That doesn't really work. Um, and so on. So now moving forward. Then the next thing that comes over is basically Knative. 
um, Knative is, is kind of perceived to be a serverless stack on top of Kubernetes, which gives you a chance to do serverless on your terms. So you don't really necessarily have to use serverless infrastructures out of cloud providers. You can also build serverless and kind of environment yourself based on Kubernetes. Combined with auto scaling there and with the, with the, um, with integration there with, with different infrastructures, your environment is going to elastically scale up and down and allocate resources as, as needed. So Knative has one of those goals there to make sure that developers and operators can work together. So developers work on different versions there of the software that's deployed in Knative, while operators are mostly in control of the traffic on top. So that's, what, that's why in, in Knative there is a serving component uh, which is looking into um, how do you activate and scale apps, and it can scale down to zero. So if you have an app that doesn't really have traffic, then it doesn't have any, any point in burning resources, right? So then as, as you get more and more requests from it, then you might want to have additional instances there going up in order to be able to cope and provide reasonable response time. Another thing is version management. So in Knative, you can also do traffic splitting. So you can split the traffic to, let's say, 80% and then 5555 five, five, five to different versions in order to figure out what actually works best for your particular scenario. Then you can monitor those and see whether they actually work or whether they don't, and you can easily roll back to the default or roll forward to the, to the new default. Another thing that you get there um, is, um, yeah, is the traffic, yeah, the percentage-based traffic we talked about. Uh, yeah, another thing, large portion of Knative is the whole event management. So when we got involved with Knative last year in kind of June, um, the default eventing there was based on Kafka, you know, which I've heard on, on one of the sessions before that you just put Kafka everywhere and then everything's cool, right? I mean, all the event and, you know, messaging needs a soft. So for us, unfortunately, that was not the solution because Kafka turned to be relatively large in resource consumption, and for our scenarios, we really didn't need anything that's so scalable. So that's why we implemented our own NATS.io, uh, NATS-based um, event implementation, and we contributed that to Knative. So currently, that's uh, one of the few options that you have there for an event bus. Uh, then Knative as well defines event sources. So how do you consume events from different systems, and there are more than 20 different plugins there for event sources that are already there in the GitHub repo. So another thing that I want you to remember is, is the whole story about serverless is actually more than functions. I mean, you can perfectly well write uh, microservices. You can package them in, a, in an image, deploy them, and that's still serverless. At the end, serverless is about not paying for either resources, not being constrained within one method of, of code, right? Then service is actually more than compute as well, because I mean you can also take images, you can deploy them on compute. Uh, but again, if you just take static compute, you're still paying for either resources, and you don't want to be doing that. Um, so that's where serverless goes into. And there is a guy, James Governor, um, he's an analyst at Redmond, and he basically said that Knative will almost certainly become the standard plumbing for functions as a service on Kubernetes. Um, and if you're wondering who, the, who that dude is, so he's actually the guy that a few years before that said that developers are the new kingmakers, and in the end, it's all, all of you guys. In the end, you're the ones kind of testing stuff, trying stuff out, and then coming up with, with creative solutions on how problems are to be solved. Then what you would typically ask at that point of time is, okay, but you know, everything's covered by now, right? I mean, you have eventing, you have elasticity, you have serverless, you know, wh what is Kima doing? So the thin layer, the 5% on top that we put, is actually trying to combine events from multiple sources and multiple enterprise apps. We're making sure that there is a standardized registration flow for apps. So we provide an ap application connectivity API there that applications can implement, and therefore they can register in Kima, therefore pushing their events towards the system and exposing their APIs accordingly. Uh, then we provide this, this layer of uniform consumption there for external services. So the Azure services, the Google services, our own that we discussed, this is all coming through that. Um, and this behaves the same way regardless whether we're talking about functions which get wrapped into containers or whether you talk about containers which are deployed directly into the Kubernetes. So ultimately, it, in that environment, you don't really have to deal with infrastructure except, except if you explicitly want to do so. You know, we don't hide the fact that it's a Kubernetes cluster. We expose the kubeconfig so you can actually connect to it. But if you don't want to, you don't have to. Then another thing we do is define the environments, which we model as namespaces in Kubernetes to make sure that people don't step onto each other's toes, other toes. So we then filter the, the service catalog there to make sure that there are different services which are exposed to different environments. The typical way it goes is that you, you go with, ha, my clock has stopped, and I wonder why those three minutes are never finishing. Interesting. So And then it's an all-in-one package that's, uh, that's going together. So if you want to learn more about that, 
Um, there are a bunch of open, open SAP courses, which are kind of free, massive op open online courses that you can go through. And then there are everything that we do as experiments is sitting in Kima Incubator, and then you can check the docs. So if you want to get involved even further in that, uh, there are a bunch of channels um, that you might want to be reaching, out, reaching to us through. And uh, if you want to get the slides, they're available here. Um, so my kind of appeal to you is don't settle for standard, but actually write event-based event apps and then keep extending. That's all that I have for you for today. So 